Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at a very heavily requested Nile Red video on turning plastic gloves into grape soda. It just sounds like alchemy, but I'm sure he'll walk us through every step of the process. Let's check it out. For all I've always liked weird chemical transformations, and over the years, I think I've done a few good ones. Like turning my pee into an artificial sweetener, and tasting it, and turning toilet paper into drinkable alcohol. You know if you want me to check those out too, those both sound pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, pee into a sweetener, that brings new meaning to the term sweet pea mixture. Something that I've always wanted to do though, was turn plastic gloves into grape soda. At first, this might seem a bit ridiculous, but like all of my other transformations, it's possible because the chemical world is often weirdly connected. In this case, there happens to be a chemical in plastic gloves, specifically vinyl ones, that's distantly related to fake grape flavor. It's not found in any I had vinyl, no idea. But a lot of them contain something called the phthalate ester, it's included to make the vinyl more durable, soft, and malleable, and this is chemically what it looks like. This, on the other hand, is one of the most commonly used fake grape flavors called methylenthranolate. Considering that one just smells like plastic and the other is supposed to smell and taste like fruit, they're shockingly similar. There are at least a few main differences, but the core of them is almost the same. They share this ring and this small portion here, and in theory, it should be possible to convert one into the other. It's interesting how that sort of stuff works. Like, the difference between water and fusion fuel in a nuclear fusion reactor is, for the hydrogen, just a couple of neutrons in that nucleus, which doesn't sound like much. Now granted, that particular isotope of hydrogen, hydrogen-3, or tritium, is extremely rare compared to hydrogen-1, but that material can be used in fusion, whereas you don't want, you don't want straight up water in a, in a nuclear fusion plant. It's a cool enough in a fission plant, but it's just so fascinating how things like that are so closely related. When you're dealing with building blocks, or granted, this that's chemical... He's talking about chemicals and even the difference between hydrogen 1 and hydrogen 3. We're not, we're not even talking about elementary particles, but how you can just change something and you can get completely different properties that do very different things. It almost seems like alchemy. So basically, my goal was to pull the phthalate ester out of some vinyl gloves, turn it into grape flavor using some chemistry magic, <laughs> to make some grape soda. I always remember that. Uh, it's, I, re I remember this really in a lot of uh, difficult math classes. Sometimes you start at the beginning of a problem and then at the end of the problem, and then you write an arrow and just write magic on there because that's the part you figure out. You start from both ends, work your way to the middle, and that's how you solve the problem. That's how I did it. I mean, I know there's a bunch of other ways, but People that are probably a lot smarter than me that can work it in order, but I've just, I've always been one of those begin with the end in mind sort of people, so there you go. It unfortunately wouldn't be super easy though, and it would take at least five major steps. Also, <laughs> just like all my other transformations, I had no idea if it would actually work. But anyway, to get things started, I first had to find some vinyl gloves that had the phthalate ester in them. Over the years, though, they've become a lot rarer because phthalates have been associated with some negative health effects. So he's using something that's toxic and converting that into a flavoring or something that you can drink. So just gives, goes to show you the level of chemistry magic he's doing, turning toxic into food. Of course, I'm not sure how healthy that grape flavoring and grape soda is anyway. A lot of companies have replaced them with safer or greener alternatives, and these wouldn't work at all. Yeah, those particular gloves. So you use a lot of gloves at a nuclear power plant, uh, mainly, especially in radiological controlled areas and uh, contaminated areas. So just to avoid the spread of contamination, there's very strict procedures for even how you put the gloves on, the order and how many types of gloves. So you, you, you use the uh, 
the plastic gloves, a, a lot of uh, radiation protection workers call them skins, and then you put the, the larger rubber gloves on top, on top of it. Some of this depends how contaminated the area actually is, but no, we don't, we don't use vinyl gloves. We try to get green, green being environmentally friendly, not, not necessarily the color gloves, just because we go through them a lot. But they can, and when they do make contact with contaminants, they are actually considered radioactive waste, but these can be cleaned and easily, um, d easily disposed of or even, even reused. So this is in the category of low-level waste, not the, not the radioactive waste that a lot of people are concerned about. I was only able to find one company called Adena that for sure had the phthalate in it. Mm. So I ordered a box of it and it arrived a couple weeks later. I then cracked Surprised it. Surprised you didn't get them off eBay. Pulled out 20 gloves. The next thing to do was to cut them up into a bunch of small pieces, which kind of ended up being a huge pain. <laughs> it turned out that cutting 20 gloves at the same time with a pair of scissors was a lot more annoying. Put them in a blender. When I was eventually done, though, I put the beaker onto a hot plate and I added isopropyl alcohol until it was completely covered. I then pushed down some of the pieces and I put a bowl filled with ice on top of it. After that, I turned on the hot plate and I brought it all to a boil. What I was doing here was using the alcohol to dissolve the phthalate ester and to pull it out of the glove. The phthalate ester actually represents a huge portion of the glove and it's apparently around 41% of it. The wow. rest of it is mostly just vinyl plastic, which is insoluble, and that just gets left behind. I let it boil like this for an hour, and then I poured it all through a funnel, plugged with some cotton. This was done to get rid of all the glove pieces, which I didn't need anymore. At this point, everything that I wanted should have been in the alcohol. After this, I put it back on the hot plate, dropped in a stir bar, and brought it back to a boil. The goal now was to concentrate it by getting rid of about half of the alcohol. So this time, I didn't include the bowl on top to condense the vapors, and I left the beaker completely open. This store itself kind of reminds me of batching boric acid. So if you don't haven't seen it in my previous videos, boric acid is basically liquid control rods. And the reason why you want to have liquid control rods that you inject into the reactor is control rods are very good at reducing the amount of power produced at the top of the core because you insert them in through the top but it shifts the uh, power peaks towards the bottom. Boric acid on the other hand will actually go into the bottom. A combination of control rods and boric acid is a nice uh, stable way to lower uh, reactor power and we're talking about a pressurized water reactor here. But it is batched in these big, heavy um, drums of just powder. And then you mix it into a tank with water. These, these plant operators actually do this. And you end up just funneling it in, this, in a stream. And you have your boric acid tanks. And it's fairly concentrated. Um, on the order of 7,000 to 8,000 parts per million boric acid. And to give you a sense, the reactor water at the beginning of core life starts off on the order of 1,400 parts per million. As you burn out the fuel, you dilute with pure water to lower the concentration of boric acid because power is gonna, power is gonna sag as you burn out the uranium fuel. So you, uh, in order to maintain reactor power at 100%, you dilute it. At the end of life, you're left with a very low, like less than 30 parts per million boric acid. But that's how you make it. You essentially, it's a, it's a solid and water batching process you get to create your uh, volume of boric acid or liquid control rods. When it was done, I pulled it off the plate and I let it cool down. When I came back to it, something had separated out, and there was a film at the bottom. 
I'm not entirely sure what it was, but it was either a bit of vinyl plastic or huh. some of the other additives that were in the glove. To clean it up, I filtered it again, and I drained everything directly into a large flask. After this, I got out a beaker, and I added 25 grams of sodium hydroxide drain cleaner to 300 mils of water, and I stirred it until it all dissolved. I then poured all of this into the flask with my alcohol. That is a very cool spherical flask. Kind of reminds me in the shape of the demon core. If you're interested in me doing... If you're interested in my thoughts on the demon core, I highly recommend you check out my reaction to Kyle Hill's video on that topic. I'll pin a comment down below. And it kind of separated into two layers. The top yellowish one was the alcohol mixed with the phthalate ester, and the bottom one was the solution that I just added. I then set it up for a reflux by adding a heating mantle <laughs> and a condenser column. When it all looked good to go, I started the stirring, it's like it's and in a I mess. cranked up the heating. As it warmed up, it got less and less cloudy, and by the time it was boiling, it had completely cleared up. Now what I had to do was keep it boiling for two hours. What I was doing here was splitting apart the phthalate ester, which was called diisononal phthalate, or DINP hmm. for short. The sodium hydroxide Ooh, wow, look at that color. and breaking it into sodium phthalate and isononal alcohol. The sodium phthalate was the part that I specifically needed for this project, and the isononal alcohol was technically just a side product. When it was done, I turned off the stirring, and I took away the heating mantle. I let it cool down a bit for around 20 minutes, and then I poured it all into a separatory funnel. Love the shapes of these things. I know like the chemistry technicians at the plant, a lot of their stuff looks a little bit more stereotypical for lack of a better word with the um, triangular shaped uh, flasks and test tubes, uh, those sort of things. A lot of that's mainly used for sampling and uh, maybe some uh, chemical additions like for, uh, for pH control or corrosion control, that sort of thing. There's not a whole lot of synthesis going on. I waited a few minutes for the layers to separate, and then I drained the bottom layer into a beaker. This bottom layer was mostly water, Those kind of and beakers it contained the stuff. sodium phthalate. The upper one was a mixture of the isopropyl alcohol and the isononal alcohol, and I poured it all into a separate container. I mentioned before that the isononal alcohol was just a side product in this project, but just by chance, it happened to be something that I needed. I have no idea when I'll actually get around to using it, but in a future video, I will probably use it. I'm gonna say, save it for a side pro for a side project. You went through the trouble of making it. Make some synthetic hot sauce. <laughs> okay. Now to this cloudy solution, <laughs> I added 50 milliliters of concentrated hydrochloric acid. The first thing that this was doing was just reacting with leftover sodium hydroxide drain cleaner and it generated a lot of heat. It was also reacting with sodium phthalate though, and turning it into phthalic acid. After a few minutes, I tested the pH, and it was around a four, which was barely acidic. It had to be much more acidic and closer to something like one, so I added some more hydrochloric acid. This time when I stirred it, it started getting really cloudy, and this was all Whoa. phthalic acid that was separating out. I again tested the pH, and it was now about 1, which was perfect. The mixture that I had here was still quite hot, and to get out as much phthalic acid as possible, I had to cool it down. To do this, I just put it in the fridge, and I left it overnight. The next day, it looked like there was a bit more, and I used a vacuum filter to get rid of all the water. I also washed it a few times with some fresh water, and I eventually had some relatively clean phthalic acid. Now, it's the next powdery. thing I had to do was convert all of this into something called phthalic anhydride. To do that, I just dumped it all into a big beaker and I turned on the hot plate. I just noticed he has this little Nile red thing on all of his uh, beakers and equipments. As it warmed up, it started giving off water vapor because the crystals were still a bit wet. I then stirred it until it looked like all the steam was gone 
and I quickly put a flask on top of it. This was all phallic and hydride. Cool. I moved it around until it kind of looked like a cotton ball, and then I was able to lift it out. Not at all what I was expecting. <laughs> I then put it back on the heat, and I again waited for more crystals to form. Now what I had to do was keep repeating this cycle until all of the phthalic acid had been converted. At first, I was having a lot of fun harvesting these puffballs, and I naively thought that it wouldn't take very long. However, I slowly realized how wrong I was when I was still doing the same thing over an hour and a half later. It turned out that because it was so fluffy, it just looked like I was making a lot. In reality, each run barely gave me anything, and it started feeling like it was a never-ending process. Mm. Eventually, though, about three and a half hours later, it stopped making any crystals, and the pain was finally... <laughs> In total, the I pain of picking cotton. 11 and a half grams of really pure and fluffy phthalic and hydride. So far, everything was going really well, but I was starting to get a bit worried. 11 and a half grams was a decent amount of phthalic and hydride, but the rest of the process was really inefficient. I would lose a lot of product with every step, and I might not have much of anything by the time that I got to the grape flavor. So last minute, I decided to process the other 80 gloves that were still in the box. Ideally, I have your backups this in one shot on a much larger scale, but unfortunately, I didn't have the equipment for it. So I just did four runs of the same thing, all at the same time. The first extraction part wasn't too bad, and it felt like I was running a little factory. <laughs> the phallic and hydride part, though, was really painful, and this is cool. He's got so many of those cool spherical flasks. Uh, I like them. Another three and a half hours. It was actually even worse than before, because this time I had to keep cycling between four of them, and I wasn't even able to take a break. <laughs> when it was eventually done, I had a bunch more phthalic and hydride. What I did find odd, though, was that the batches weren't very consistent. I had two that were closer to 11, one that was around 12, Size, mass. and one that was above 13. I have no idea why this happened, but either way, I now had 58.4 grams in total. This was way better than just 11 and a half, and this made me feel a lot more confident. Now the next thing to do was turn all of this phthalic and hydride into something called thalamide. To make this happen, the first step was to compress the puffballs because right now, they were mostly air. I did this by just stabbing them and mixing them around, and I did it for every bottle. When I was done, it was still mostly air, but it was significantly better than it was before. I then shoved everything that I had into a large flask, and it almost filled the entire thing. Now with all the cool. and hydride loaded, it's I a snow globe. the only other ingredient that I needed, which was 12 grams of urea. The easiest way to do this was by using a hot oil bath, and I set one up using vegetable oil. Okay. When it all looked good to go, I turned on the hot plate, and I waited for it to warm up. I was hoping that it would melt again or something, but it didn't look like too much happened. As a last attempt to fix it, I decided to try mixing it around. I thought that maybe the puffiness of the anhydride had prevented it from properly mixing with the urea. Mechanical agitation could always work. Even though it hadn't really melted, it had compressed a lot, and it was quite hard. This made me think that it would be really hard to break apart, but it was surprisingly easy. I then heated it for another 30 minutes at 170 C, and again, it looked like nothing happened. I figured I would just move on to the next purification step, and I would find out pretty quickly if it had failed. I dumped everything that I had into a beaker, and on top of it, I added 500 mils of hot water. 
In the boiling water, any urea would easily dissolve, and the phthalic anhydride would get turned back into phthalic acid. I like how it just shows all these little, these little chemistry diagrams of what he's doing, because never heard of phthalic anything. <laughs> and then dissolve. The chemical that I was hoping I made, though, thalamide, was nearly insoluble, and it would just stay as a solid. So what I was waiting for here was to see how much of this stuff would disappear. While it was still hot, I poured it all into a vacuum filter, and I pulled off the water. I washed the powder a few times with boiling water, and then I dumped it all into a bowl. At this point, it was still kind of wet, so I threw it into an oven for a few hours. When it was done, I had 46.7 grams of nice and dry thalamide, which was way more than I had expected. I mean, it still wasn't as good as it could have been, but it was more than good enough. Now it looks like powdered sugar. Probably wouldn't recommend eating it though. Now the next step was to make anthranilic acid, and this was the part that I really wasn't sure about. Making it from thalamide is notoriously annoying, and it has a tendency to completely fail. Everything had to be done very carefully, and even slight mistakes could turn it into a huge mess. However, I had done it years ago, and I had found what I thought was a decent way to do it. I figured if I just repeated exactly what I did, it should turn out fine. The first thing that I needed was to get some concentrated bleach, which usually has a concentration between 8 and 10 when it's fresh. Bleach slowly degrades over time though, and I had to know its exact concentration. To do this, I put together this little setup. In the main flask, I loaded it with a very specific amount of bleach, and in the addition funnel above it, I added some 3% peroxide. When I opened the stopper and I let them mix together, they reacted to make oxygen gas. I added enough peroxide to destroy all the bleach, and all of this oxygen was bubbled into an inverted grad cylinder. This <laughs> That looks like a crazy setup. Seeing this whole thing about converting gloves to something in grape soda, I'm not all that surprised that you can get some crazy results. For instance, fissioning uranium-235, which uranium-235 in a fuel pellet is actually a solid, a, a ceramic, within, and it's cooled by highly pressurized water. But a couple of the fission products are actually krypton and xenon, which are gases. So you can get something very different from what you've started as a byproduct, even. Note that Krypton and Xenon don't show up in every single fission event. There is a range of probabilities as to what Uranium-235 or Plutonium-239, for that matter, can fission into. What's interesting about is it can actually slow down the fission reaction because it has a much higher probability of absorbing a neutron than a Uranium-235 nucleus. So reactor operators refer to it as poison because... It slows down the fission reaction and could even shut down the reaction if it grows in an uncontrolled manner. But it's just something that reactor operators have to uh, compensate for because when it builds in as a result of some fissions, it lowers reactor power, but it also burns itself out. And xenon-135 turns into xenon-136, which doesn't have that same property. That's one way to think of it going away. It's just something that has to be managed. And poor management of xenon was one of the contributing causes to the Chernobyl accident. Let me measure how much oxygen was being made. And from this, I was able to do some calculations and find out the concentration of the bleach. I did it five times to get a good little set of data and it averaged out at around 11%. Now that I knew this, I could get started and I added water to a flask along with some sodium hydroxide drain cleaner. I let it stir until it all dissolved, and then I put together an ice bath. I also added a thermometer, and I waited for it to cool to around 0 C. When it eventually got there, I started adding the bleach, and the amount that I used was based on that 11% concentration, 
that I had just calculated. Makes sense. As I did this, the temperature would increase a bit, and it was important to keep it below 5C. To help with this, I pre-cooled the bleach in the fridge, and I also only added it in small portions. When I was done, I took the flask out of the ice bath, and I dropped in a funnel. Now what I had to do was add all the thalamide, and I started dumping it in. As it mixed with the bleach, it didn't look like much was happening, and this was mostly because it wasn't very soluble. Up until now, everything seemed to be going pretty well, but then it started turning yellow, and it quickly became orange. Mm -hmm. The temperature also started to rise, and it eventually peaked around 45 C. This was unfortunately exactly what I wanted to avoid. When I did this reaction before, on a small scale, it was totally fine, but apparently on a larger scale, there are some temperature issues. I had faith that it could still be okay, and I figured it was worth continuing. I mean, I had also used everything that I had, so I didn't really have a choice. After this... Interesting how the effects of temperature can accelerate the rate of reactions. Like, for instance, we use hydrazine in nuclear power plants for oxygen scavenging, so corrosion control, since oxygen causes a lot of corrosion in uh, piping. But we don't use it in primary reactor systems because the temperature is way too high, um, upwards of 500, 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And hydrazine will break down into its components, such as hydrogen gas, when at high temperatures. So temperature control is very... I do understand temperature control when doing any sort of water chemistry thing. <laughs> I added some more cold sodium hydroxide solution. I was kind of expecting it to make the color even darker, but it pretty much stayed the same. At this point, the temperature sensitive part of the reaction was done, and the next thing that I had to do was heat it up. So I put it in a hot water bath that I'd set up at 80C, and I left it there for 30 minutes. This just really helped drive the reaction to completion, and to push it all into being sodium and thranolate. That's good, yeah, water's very good, very good thermal conductivity. That's a high specific heat. One of the reasons why it's very commonly used as a working fluid in uh, power plants. Good for that even heating. Done, it looked almost exactly the same, and I poured everything into a beaker. I then washed the flask with a bit of water, and I set up another ice bath. When it had cooled down to around 0 C, I tested the pH, and it was strongly basic. This was from all the drain cleaner that I had added, and what I had to do next was make it acidic. To do this, I started adding dilute hydrochloric acid. This would generate a lot of heat though, so I did it slowly to keep the temperature around 0 C. I also had to keep checking the pH using some pH papers. I decided to quickly get rid of this by just filtering it through some cotton. I'm really not sure why, but as it was filtered, it somehow got darker. When it was done, I put it back on ice and I continued adding the acid. It made more CO2, and the anthranilic acid that appeared stayed longer and longer. It again got darker though, which I didn't really like. Eventually, the anthranilic acid started to actually stay, but by this point, it was almost black. That's crazy how it's causing that, causing it to get so much darker. I checked the pH and it was around 5, which was slightly acidic, but I wanted it to be 4. This is because it's at that pH that the anthranilic acid is the least soluble. Okay. Above or below 4, it tends to act as a base or an acid, and it becomes more water soluble. At 4 though, it's a neutral molecule, and it becomes almost insoluble in water. Kind of counterintuitive, because pH of 7 is where you're neutral, but... I guess we're talking solubility rather than pure um, acidic versus caustic. Ideally, the anthranilic acid would have been white 
or maybe slightly yellow, but what I had here kind of looked like a bunch of dirt. This again was because it got too hot. It does look like a bunch, a bunch of dirt. Side reactions to happen. If I had the chance to try it again, I'd mix the chemicals in a different way to avoid the temperature issue. But I really only had one shot at this, and I was gonna have to deal with the mess that I made. When it eventually got to that pH of 4, I poured it all into my vacuum filter. I then washed it a few times with water, and I was really hoping that it would magically take away some of the color. However, it didn't seem to make any difference. What I had now was a bunch of crude anthranilic acid, and it was way more than I ever thought I'd get. I was really tempted to just move on to the next and last step with this, but it was a little too dirty. I was going to have to at least try and clean it up a bit, and I decided to do a recrystallization. This looks like some nasty mud pie experiment. <laughs> so I dumped it all into a beaker, along with a bunch of boiling water. I also added some activated charcoal to see if it would get rid of the color. Activated charcoal, huh? I boiled it for a few minutes, and then I filtered it all into a flask that was kept hot by a hot plate. When everything had passed through, I took it off, and I waited for it to cool to room temperature. It took a while, but some really nice white crystals started forming, which I was really happy about. The liquid was so dark that it was hard to see, but there were also crystals growing inside. I let it fully cool overnight, I'll see and the next day, there were a lot more crystals. They unfortunately still kind of looked brown, but I was hoping that oh, it was just a really dark solution that was making it look like that. I then filtered them off, and I was really hoping to see some nice white crystals, but they were still really dark. I feel like they might have even looked worse, which was a bit discouraging. Despite the color, it was still probably better than before, but I wanted to fix it up a bit more. However, I... Now it looks like steel wool. <laughs> I like each individual step throughout this. It's, it's pretty cool to see gloves and it going through all these weird transitions from like this yellow dirty water to, br to brown stuff to, to cotton balls to mud to steel wool and then eventually to grape soda. I figured that doing another recrystallization with water was just a waste of time. So what I did instead was put it all in a beaker, and I started adding methanol. The anthranilic acid was much more soluble in methanol, and the goal here was to add just enough to dissolve everything. When it had all disappeared, there was still a small amount of junk floating around, so I quickly filtered it through some cotton. After that, I added cold water, which reduced the solubility of the anthranilic acid and caused it to separate. I then added a whole bunch of extra water just to make sure that I knocked it all out. This time, it looked way better than before, and when I filtered it, it actually kind of looked okay. Cool, it's to way lighter. Dry it. I put it into a vacuum chamber, and I kept it under vacuum overnight. I opened it up the next morning, and what I had now was a light brown powder. Ideally, it would have been white, but as far as I know, not even chemical companies sell a perfectly white version. It's always mm, light okay. brown, or at least slightly yellow. What I also find interesting is that even though this is only one step away from the final grape flavor, it doesn't smell anything like grape. But anyway, overall, this reaction was a mess.
I only ended up getting 10.2 grams, mm. which wasn't amazing. If everything had gone well, it probably would have been closer to 25 or 30 grams, so this was a bit sad. But either way, in theory, this was still more than enough for the last step. So now, to make the final grape flavor, I put everything back into a flask, and I added 75 mils of methanol. I stirred it until it all dissolved, and then I added some concentrated sulfuric acid. As it was added, it was reacting with the anthranilic acid to make a sulfate salt, which wasn't very soluble in methanol. It initially didn't look like too much was happening, but then a bunch of solid stuff suddenly separated out. There Whoa, that's... <laughs> that looked kind of crazy how it just showed up. So much of it that it caused it to freeze, and to loosen it up, I had to stir it manually. That didn't seem to be working too well though, so I took it off the stand and I shook it around a bit. After that, I added some more sulfuric acid and I let it stir for 30 minutes. I also turned on the hot plate to try to get some of the sulfate salt to dissolve and to prevent it from freezing again. When I came back to it, I added the last bit of sulfuric acid, which caused the methanol to heat up even more, and everything dissolved. I then added a heating mantle and a condenser column, and I cranked up the heat. After that, I waited for it to come to a boil, and then I kept boiling it for two hours. The reaction wow. that I was doing here was called a Fischer esterification, and I was reacting the anthranilic acid with the methanol. The reaction was catalyzed by the sulfuric acid, and the result was the methylenthranolate grape flavor. However, it wasn't a free base, and it was still in its sulfate salt form. When it was eventually done, I took away the heating mantle, and I let it cool down a bit. I then took off the condenser column, and I was hit with the smell of grape candy. So clearly, it had worked, but I still had no idea how much I actually made. That's red. What I had now was still very acidic from all the sulfuric acid, and I had to neutralize it. To do this, I started adding a solution of saturated sodium carbonate. It immediately started reacting and releasing CO2 gas, and the pH slowly increased. Besides just neutralizing the sulfuric acid, though, it was also reacting with that sulfate salt of the methylenthranolate and turning it into its pure freebase form. When I was done adding all the sodium carbonate, I dumped in a bunch of extra water. Now to separate the grape flavor from this mess, I poured it all into a separatory funnel. I then added something called dichloromethane, or DCM for short. This is a solvent that can dissolve the methylenthranolate but it isn't able to mix with water. The lower layer was the DCM, and I drained it all into a beaker. I then did it four more times, which should have, in theory, pulled out close to 100% of the methylenthranolate. When I was done, I drained out the DCM, and the next thing to do was one last drying step. To do this, I just dumped in some anhydrous sodium sulfate and I stirred it for 15 minutes. After this, I got rid of sodium sulfate by filtering it through some cotton, and I collected everything in a round bottom flask. What I had to do now was get rid of the DCM, so I put together another distillation setup. I was eventually left with a dark red colored oil, and I transferred it all to a much smaller flask. What I had now was really crude and dirty methylenthranolate, and I had to clean it up a bit more. To do this, I had to do another distillation, but it couldn't just be a regular one, and it had to be under vacuum. Doing it under a vacuum was very important because it would let me do it at a much lower temperature and without any air present. This would prevent the grape flavor from just decomposing or reacting with oxygen in the air. After a while, I started seeing vapor forming and condensing, and stuff started coming over. I'm not sure what this stuff was, but it was mostly side product 
and other junk. <laughs> I like the technical term side product and other junk. By the way, in the secondary uh, cycle of a nuclear power plant, the reason why the uh, turbine exhaust goes to a condenser, so the purpose of the condenser is just to convert the steam back into water so it can feed the steam generators, which form the secondary loop, the thing that is heated by the reactor in order to produce steam and to produce electricity. One of the reasons why I use a vacuum is just to filter out the non-condensable gases. And because if you didn't, well, it's going to significantly reduce the heat transfer rate and the, uh, the thermal efficiency of the system. And this is something where 1% efficiency change one way or the other is a ton of money. So it's important to maintain those systems very well. It was only when it got to around 131C that the methyl anthranolate started coming over. I then turned this adapter to a new vial and I kept collecting it here until the temperature started rising again. I had no idea how much I was actually going to get and I was a bit worried that it would only be a few drops. That didn't turn out to be the case though and I was really happy when I saw that I was collecting a decent amount. The moment that I saw it increase above 131, I turned it to another vial and I collected it for a few minutes. I then turned off the heating and I let everything cool down to room temperature. While I was waiting for that to happen though, I wanted to try shooting it with UV light. I had read online that it was supposed to fluoresce and I hmm. really wanted to try it out. So I turned off all the lights and I turned on my UV lamp. The color that it made was honestly one of the nicest things that I've seen working on this channel. That's cool. I, I never would have expected that. It's kind of, uh, kind of similar to the uh, Cherenkov blue. This Cherenkov blue that you actually see in a nuclear power plant is the result of particles traveling faster than light. Now, it's impossible to travel faster than light in a vacuum but it is possible to travel faster than light and water. The speed of light in a vacuum is about 300,000 kilometers per second, but in water it gets cut to 225 kilometers per second. Some particles, when you're dealing with high-speed uh, nuclear physics, can actually go faster than that, not faster than in the vacuum. So we're not going to run into any sort of crazy light warp drive scenarios and bizarre time travel type stuff that you'd run into for violating space-time laws. Not yet, anyway. That's not what's happening here, but it's kind of what it reminded me of. It's a bit unfortunate, though, because I don't feel like the camera really did it justice. When it eventually got to room temperature, I released the vacuum, and I took the whole thing apart. I then pulled out the three separate fractions, and I put Junk. them into different Trash. vials. Just for fun, I smelled the first and last vials, and they weren't great. I'm really not sure how to describe them, but they kind of had a weird plasticky smell. The main stuff, though, Well, yeah, it started off with plastic gloves. <laughs> completely different, and it had a strong grape smell, but it also had an odd mustiness to it. I, again, don't mustiness. Really know how to describe it, but it was honestly a bit off-putting. This surprised me because from everything that I had read, I thought it was going to be exactly like grape candy. <laughs> At first, I thought that maybe it was just from an impurity. So, to compare it, I ordered a small amount of pure methyl anthranolate from a chemical company. It ended up smelling exactly the same though, which honestly kind of surprised me. After that, I did something called thin layer chromatography to compare what I made with the stuff that I knew was pure. It confirmed that I did have methyl anthranolate, and it showed that it was pretty clean. So I guess that's just how it smells. But either way, huh. after weeks of work, I was finally done, and I had more than enough to start putting together my grape soda. Before that, though, I just quickly wanted to taste it. Still tasting it, true. <laughs> no, no, that that is not recommended. Uh... <laughs> Most labs are no food, no drink at all. You have to step outside and, you know, clean, at least clean yourself up. Radiological control areas take that a step further because the main hazard is because anything involving contaminants internally is 
way, way worse than externally. One, the dose would be higher. And two, it's a pain to remove. Okay, so I'm hoping that it tastes a little, a little bit better than it smells. God, it's awful. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Uh, gotta take one for the team. It's so much for worse. For science. And it... It also kind of burns. <laughs> I like how happy he is about it. <laughs> He's a trooper. I'm gonna be honest, and say that I knew it wasn't gonna be very good. But anyway, now to make the grape soda, I had to find a recipe, and it was surprisingly hard. I couldn't find anything that gave quantities, and it was always just generic ingredients. I also started realizing that I might have misread some of the info about methyl anthranolate. A lot of sources said that methyl anthranolate was used for the flavor of grape Kool-Aid and other grape products, and I thought this meant as the only flavor. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. It's like it's used in it, but it's not the only flavor. Mm. However, I think it meant more that it was just one of the flavoring agents. I never thought my grape soda was going to be great, and this was making me doubt it even more. After not finding any recipes, I decided that the best thing to do was to just try and copy grape Kool-Aid. The ingredients were very simple, and even if other flavors were used, the methyl anthranolate was apparently the major one. From the ingredients list, I was able to get the amount of sugar that was in it, and I assumed that I would just have to do trial and error, for the citric and ascorbic acid. However, I didn't have to do any of that at all because figuring this out is apparently a common high school lab. From their results, I was able to really? do some quick math and I came up with my own bootleg recipe. <laughs> Looks like something you'd see on a lemonade stand with kids, love it. I based the amount of acids on the Kool-Aid, but I jacked up the amount of sugar mm. to match other grape sodas like Fanta. Before doing this, I had no idea, but grape sodas apparently have an insane amount of sugar in them. So now- There's a lot of sugar in any type of uh, sodas, soft drinks and stuff. Surprising. That's why dentists hate it. Put it all together, I started by adding a crazy 55 grams of sugar. After that, I shot in about 1.1 grams of citric acid and 0.1 of ascorbic acid. I then poured in just enough water to get it above the fill line. It wouldn't be grape soda if it weren't purple, so I added some red and blue dye, and I stirred it until everything dissolved. After this, I was done making the base of the soda, which at this point was just some slightly acidic purple sugar water. What I had to do now was actually flavor it by adding the methyl anthranolate, and I shot in two doses, of 12 and a half milligrams. This reminds me, him saying shooting any type of, whether it be a dose, even a light, acid, shooting acid's a common one, of all of the prohibited radio communications that we had at the nuclear plant that I worked at, just to avoid using colloquialisms. And I, I can sort of understand why, because Precision of language and very distinctive sounding language is very important on the on radio transmission so people understand what you're talking about, but people don't like to hear uh, shooting acid or <laughs> or uh, I'm gonna shoot a tank meaning a meaning a liquid waste discharge all about being good nuclear professionals though I can understand it has some good reasons like you don't want to say, you never say hydrogen or nitrogen because they sound the same on a gargled radio transmission, but those two, two chemicals do very different things and you do not want to mix them up. Normally, methyl anthranolate would be almost insoluble in water, but I think the acidity of the citric acid might help it dissolve. So what I had now was hopefully some pure chemical grape juice, and the last step was to carbonate it. I did this using one of those household carbonator things, and I blasted it with a bunch of CO2. <laughs> there we go. 
When I eventually felt that it was good, I pulled it off very carefully to prevent it from overflowing. After all this, I was now apparently done, and I could finally taste my soda and see how terrible it probably was. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is smell it. And it's, it actually does kind of smell like grape, but Kinda. it also still has that weird mustiness or kind of off-putting scent that the pure stuff had. I was hoping that it would just... Smells good. Okay, I used a lot more methyl. Magically go away, but uh, it, it's clearly still there. But hopefully, unlike the pure stuff, it's uh, not going to taste horrible. Okay, it it does taste like grape soda, but it's maybe it's just a really bad. <laughs> it definitely has like it's hard to describe. It definitely has a grape mission accomplished question mark profile to it, but it's really limited in flavor, and it's kind of like there's just that part that makes you know it's grape and nothing else, which I guess makes sense because I only added one ingredient. But honestly, it's. I'll try it again. <laughs> I think it's still better than diet soda. And I, think, <laughs> I think if I were really desperate, I, I could drink it. I don't know if I'd enjoy it, but it, it's more than drinkable. It's really just the smell that's kind of weird. Okay, so my plastic love Nile soda grape. was amazing, but it did taste like grape. And that was all that really mattered. To me, just the fact that I started with vinyl gloves and ended up with something that tasted fruity was more than a success. Also, as an added bonus, I was really happy to find that chemical that I was missing. There you go. Safe for later. Hot sauce. I have no idea when I'll actually do that, though, because these long synthesis projects take forever to film and put together. It doesn't seem like it from the final video, but it's really time consuming and I think this one took over 40 days. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, just like I saw in his uh, superconductors video of all those, was it 28 hour heating cycles that he attempted? He put so much work into these. I, I really appreciate all the effort he does. So there you have it. You can turn gloves into grape soda. Can be done. That's really cool to see all those intricate steps. And I'm always taken in by Nile Red's process, the way he carries himself, the way he shows all the steps, and it's all very precise, methodical. It's kind of, it's one of those ASMR things to me. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.